What's up, duelists? Now, this video is going to be a little bit different from your everyday video. This video, I went really, really far with this concept because I legitimately believe this concept to be a strong competitive strategy in today's metagame. I'm going to be doing a full comprehensive guide showing some sideboard uh, patterns, showing six different replays, and uh, talking about the list quite a bit in this video. So if you like this type of video, if you like me going really, really far into depth with some of the concepts that I am sort of pitching on the channel, like, subscribe. If this video does well, I may do more of this with more unique decks, more unique strategies. I may try and find more ways to crack the metagame and go really into depth with it uh, if you guys like this. And if not, then I'll just go back to regular eight-man videos. You know, whatever, whatever works. But we're trying something new today and just, you know, show your support if you like it. All right, so the deck you're looking at. I had the idea for this deck a few nights ago in a dream. It came to me in a dream, and I and I know that that sounds insane, but I was just like, I was dreaming I was playing Edison, and I, in my dream, I summoned a gadget, and I was like, okay, I search another gadget, right? I summon green gadget, I search red gadget, okay. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, I summoned a gadget, and then on my next turn, I summoned another gadget, and I was like pressuring my opponent, and they were forced to use a Gemini Spark on my gadget, and this is what happened in my dream, and I was like, okay. That seems like something that could happen, right? And then after they used the Gemini Spark on my gadget, I OTK'd them with Black Wings. <laughs> and that was in my dream. And I was just like, I wonder if that's possible. Like, to have a way to play this sort of gadget and Black Wing deck all together at once. And I think that this deck is actually legit. Because, because, because the gadgets do a really good job at, like, softening up the opponent and applying, like, little consistent pressure. If you get in a couple of chip shots with these guys, it makes it very easy to close out the game with the Blackwing play. So I think that these cards actually complement what the Blackwing deck is doing, like, a lot. <laughs> I think they're actually really, really good in this deck. And, uh, like, alternatively to Sirocco, right, like playing Sirocco in the main deck, playing certain cards in the main deck, the gadgets are good both going first and going second and i think that that's really important and it's something we need to start talking about more and more as edison format gets more and more developed because you know if your opponent is setting a raiko term one if you're going second and you're summoning a soroko that's not bad don't get me wrong that's not bad but if you're going first and you have soroko in your hand you just have to pass the turn and then your opponent gets to set their raiko and it's almost like you didn't even get to go first so that's why i really like the gadgets in this deck i'll show you a little bit more of the concepts uh, as we get into the replays and stuff but the general idea, the general game plan is soften the opponent up with the gadgets and then use the black wings later on in the game to close things out. The gadgets also do a couple of other things that are really nice in this deck. They thin your deck. They make it so you can play Pot of Avarice, which is actually one of the best cards in black wings, uh, ironically, because if you think about it, Blizzard is like two cards for Pot of Avarice, right? And Kalut fuels Pot of Avarice. And being able to reuse Dark Armed and Gale is really, really big in this deck. Um, so yeah, being able to play Pot of Avarice consistently is really nice. There was a Blackwing list that topped at RBE Team Reno Valley. I think it was top 16, and it had Pot of Avarice in the main, and I was just like, man, Pot of Avarice is super, super good in Blackwings. Like, I've played it before in the past with Armageddonite builds, but you could never really consistently keep your graveyard going because you wanted to do Vayu stuff, and so it, like, kind of conflicted with what you were doing with Avarice, but in this type of list, you do get to play Pot of Avarice, which is really nice. Uh, another thing is you get a main deck Smashing Ground, which I think is a really slept on card in Black Wings. Oftentimes people will play around Icarus Attack, leave only one monster in play, and then you can just Smash and Ground it. Same thing with all the rest of sp Spot Removal, we're just not playing Icarus Attack. That's just the plan here, is just not to play it. Uh, because the gadgets do a good job of breaking through the back row, you don't really need to play Icarus Attack for those big sweeping uh, pushes. You just play the Spot Removal, and that's kind of the game plan of the deck. Like into Hero Beat, you just Spot Removal them, and then you summon a gadget. And then if they summon another monster attack over your gadget, you spot removal them again, you summon another gadget. And you just rinse and repeat until you basically run them out of cards, and then you can OTK them with Black Wings, or you can just run them over with the Black Wing cards once they're low resource. The trap cards, I think these are the best trap cards for this deck. I think Compulsory has merit in the main deck because Stardust Dragon can give you trouble, but Deep Prison is just the best card game one. So that's, that's the reason why we're playing. Triple Deep Prison, no Compulsory in the main. Double Road, Road is really important in this deck. You do need to open it. Um, you have three ways to basically stop Heavy Storm, which is Road, Judgment. I think Road is, like, the most important because you're just going to commit multiple gadgets into stuff like Torrential, into stuff like Mirror Force. You're just going to keep committing with this deck. And so Road is really important. 
Road is also an auto win card in this format. It's one of the only auto win cards, and I think that like people should understand that and play more Road because Road is just that good. Road is just that dude, you know? And people never play around it. That's another thing too. So playing double is good. Um, yeah, spells, straightforward stuff. Nothing really to say about the spells. Tragodia is a cool inclusion. With the gadgets, you do keep card advantage very nicely. So Tragodia, you can actually play in this deck. As opposed to the normal Blackwing decks that get into top deck mode very quickly, Trigodia is really strong in this style of deck. You can pitch your monsters, steal their monsters, or you can just use him as a beat stick, or you can just use him to synchro. So a lot of the lot of parts of the bison with Trigodia. Yeah, you get the idea. The sideboard is where things get interesting. We've got double prohibition. This card I've been very impressed with. It is a card that fills multiple roles. It stops a lot of unfair decks, and it's great versus frogs, which is something that I've noticed. I'll show you guys in the replays. It's also insane versus hero beat. Frogs and Hero Beat are two of the most popular decks right now. So you can just Prohibition, name that. You can bring in uh, Prohibition versus Vayu Turbo. Name Vayu, name Sirocco, whatever. It's pretty good there. Uh, Nobleman of Crossout is the only other card I want to fit a second copy of into the sideboard. But due to the sideboarding patterns, we don't have space for a second one. It is really, really important in this deck. It is really, really good because Hamster is annoying. But I think just the one is fine. I think you can get away with just the one. One DD Crow because you only have space for one. You need double Sirocco, Cyber Dragon, and Kinetic Soldier because the siding pattern versus Hero Beat has you taking out four monsters and you bring in these four. And these are basically just four monsters that run over alias. So if they don't have um if they don't have Gemini Spark, then you just run them over with these, basically. Royal Oppression stops Glads. Glads is like the worst matchup for this deck. It's like really, really bad. Um, but not a lot of people are playing Glads right now. So I think it's fine to not really side much more than just the Royal Oppressions for them. Compulsory, Trap Holes for Black Wings. It's also kind of a third rug versus Frogs. Rug is just rug, and then Mind Crush, uh, you bring it in going first versus Heroes because you can grab their Stratos off their E-Call, and that's pretty much it. Extra Deck is very straightforward. The only main difference is we've gone down to one Armor Master, and we've got that Mistworm. And the reason we have the Mistworm here is because it does come up quite frequently where you have a Gadget, a Blizzard, and a Kalut. Or, you know, some combination of Shura, Vayu, Gadget, that sort of thing. That comes up a lot. And you can always shuffle back your Armor Master with your Pot of Avarice if you need a second one. So, I think that that's, um, that's a fine, fine change to make for this build. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the siding patterns. Because um, I want to talk about that first before we go into uh, the replays. So, the first siding pattern I want to show you is this is how I sided versus, or this is how I side versus Vayu Turbo, which is one of the more popular decks. So, against Vayu Turbo, I side out Ashura, I side out the Vayu, I side out Kalu, I side out Smashing Ground, Shrink, and Starlight Road. The reason we're siding out Starlight Road is that they might leave in their oppressions, and they also don't have a lot of ways to proc Starlight Road. It's just Torrential, Mirror, and Heavy. So, you can side one out in that matchup. And then I bring in the Crow to stop their Vayu plays or their Plague play. Plague is like their number one power play next to Dark Arm Dragon. Uh, Sirocco's, you gotta bring him in to run over the Arms Wing, they're just a Mirror Breaker. Cyber Dragon to help run into Raikos. Uh, Nobleman, again, for the Raikos, and then you bring in Compulsory as well. You can change this sideboarding pattern if you have a different sideboard, but I think that this is what works best for Value Turbo. We're gonna refer back to this because I side similarly versus Quick Draw, but I also bring in the Pulling the Rugs and the Royal Oppression, so, uh, you'll see, you'll see the similar side versus Quick Draw later on. This is the siding pattern versus regular black wings. So against regular black wings, you don't need to side that much. Your main deck is already really well tuned to beat regular black wings. What you do is you just side out one Shura and one DD Crow and you side in both Sirocos and then you side out the Dushu and you side in the compulsory evac. And that's it. That's all you really need to do. You can consider some pulling the rugs depending on their build. You can consider Cyber Dragon going second. And you could consider Royal Oppression depending on their build again, but I think that this is the best build. You could also consider DD Crow if they're on like the Greffer shenanigans. I think DD Crow is probably fine there. Um, but this is this is how you should side versus regular Black Wings. And just lean into your spot removal and lean into your card advantage. And you basically just want to simplify the game state as quickly as possible versus regular Black Wings. And you will always win in the simplified game state because you have a steady stream of monsters thanks to Gadgets and Pot of Avarice, whereas your opponent won't always have that steady stream because they just might not have their Black Whirlwind. Um, okay, and then the last siding pattern I want to show you is this is how I side versus Hero Beat. So I side out Dark Arm Dragon, one Blizzard, I side out the Vayu, I side out the Shrink, one Kalut, and one Shura. Shura gets outclassed, Kalut also gets outclassed by Honest, so they're like not the best. I side out one Starlight Road, Hero Beat doesn't have a lot of ways to proc it. I side out Dust Shoot because they play very few monsters. And if you're going second, or if you get into the late game, Dust Shoot is a pretty bad top deck. 
Now you'll notice I have the Cyber Dragon in. I only side in the Cyber Dragon going second. Going first, I bring in the Mind Crush. So that's the big difference going second versus going first. I think that this is the best configuration versus Hero Beat. Your game plan is to just go uh, Yellow Gadget, whatever, Search Gadget, force them through all their cards, survive, and then take over the game with either Pot of Avarice or like repeated Cypher Soldiers or a Soroka or a Cyber Dragon. That's pretty much all you need. And then you have Prohibition to name either Miracle Fusion or Alias, which is a guaranteed win if it just sticks around. I think that this is the best way to side versus Hero Beat. It gives you the best, um, it gives you the best grounded game. It gives you the most activity. You're not stuck with like Ashura facing down a, uh, what is that card? Facing down, I'm forgetting the name of the card, Alias. You could consider leaving in the second Blizzard. That is the last card that I was considering leaving in for one of the Royal Oppressions. If your opponent is playing a more stun-focused build of Hero Beat, then you can consider not even bringing in the Royal Oppressions at all. You can leave in the Blizzard and potentially the Kalut or the uh, Shura or the DD Crow to help fight Hero Blast. But I think that this is, generally speaking, the best the best configuration. All right, let's go ahead and hop into the matches. So the first match I played with this deck was versus Furman Supreme. I played against him in an 8-man recently, so he's a solid player. You know the vibes. He's out here in the Discord. And we open up decent, but we're going second. And we get turn 1 Norlarist, which is really annoying. Because <laughs> our hand would have been insane going first. As you can see... We have, you know, Heavy Storm to break back row. We have Whirlwind in case we draw a Blackwing monster. We have Dust Shoot to take their hand. We have Road to protect our stuff. And we have our stream of monsters in Yellow Gadget. So literally a nut draw, but unfortunately we are going second. So we are going to lose our hand. That being said, he also has nothing. So, you know, it's kind of a top deck war. We find Brain Control, which doesn't do anything. We draw a Deep Prison, which doesn't do anything. Set the Deep Prison pass. He draws passes. I draw a Red Gadget. He shows confusion in my deck. One thing that's nice about this deck is people won't know how to side against it, at least initially. So if you bring it to your locals, uh, people will be pretty surprised. We attack for 13, pass the turn, and he goes Cold Wave Dark Creator off the top, and that's going to be an OTK. So we go to game two. How I sided versus this deck. So one of the very nice things about um, Prohibition is that you can... Where the fuck is dueling book thing oh prohibition is that it's good versus the unfair decks as well as the fair decks and that's why i think this card is so key i brought in the two prohibitions i brought in my dd crow i brought in royal oppression to help stop the wyvern and the dark creator that sort of thing and then i believe that's it i might have oh i also brought in mind crush to stop gold sarcophagus and as well as naming phantom of chaos when he goes for an obvious or laris play so yeah that's what we cited in this matchup we open up triple gadget but we do have bora plus whirlwind which will at least get us to Kalut. Next turn, we can summon Kalut, search Gale, make an Armor Master, and then we have Armor Master value in case he goes for Norlaris. We can Silverwind him. He starts off with Allure, banishes a Sky Scourge, goes for a Rota. Now let's take a look at his hand. I haven't looked at his hand quite yet. Let's see what his hand can do. So he could pitch to special the Greffer, but then he doesn't have another Dark here in order to pitch to send the Norlaris and get a turn one Norlaris. And even if he did that, it's not really looking that good for him. He, he does have a Wyvern in the grave, but he doesn't have enough darks to really make anything happen. So he's just going to go for the Slow Greffer, Pitch Creator, Send Norlaris, set up for the Phantom next turn, set the deck to Heaven Pass. We draw Dim Prison, but we kind of get to do what we wanted to do, which is Summon Kalut, go grab Gale. And now I know that the only trap cards this deck plays is Deck Dev and Royal Decree, so I'm pretty safe to just go for everything into his back row. I'm pretty confident he's not playing Torrential or Mirror Force. So we just have that, run it over, attack with everything. This is, I believe, maximum damage. And then main phase two, we do make that Armor Master. Armor Master serves a dual purpose. Not only does it insulate us from the Norlaris, but it also stops him from like going for a big OTK. We have Deep Prism, but I'm fairly certain at this point he does have that Royal Decree. He's going to go for Phantom of Chaos, uh, Banish, Activate, drop to 2750 chain deck dev but this isn't going to matter he needs to rip here or else he's dead to the silver wind on the way back so yeah that's what happens and yeah he draws dark greffer we reveal brain control to the deck dev and then we banish banish summon silver wind attack for game so that's going to be game two now game three is going to be tough because we are going second so if we get norlaris turn one again uh, it's going to be hard to come back but we do have some of our cyborg cards so if we get a chance to have our turn we can actually play through it so he starts off with future fusion which is very nice it's a very good draw he's able to send double wyvern and red med and then he also has a trade in as well after he's thinned his deck which is really strong start for him 
he can set two back row and then i'm fairly confident he has deck dev here and i'm also fairly confident he has royal decree as well so i'm feeling kind of owned but alas here we are we just have to try our best i get to go to main phase one which is good he does wait for our summon which is really really lucky for us we priority gale target a red med and what he does here is he actually lets us run over this red med um, in the battle phase, he should have deck dev sacrificed his other red med to destroy our gale. That would have kept him with at least one red med in play. Uh, as it stands here, he's kind of owned, basically. One of his sets is also a bluff, too. Spoiler alert. So we are going to activate the smashing main phase, too. He is going to chain the deck devastation virus, but alas, he should have deck dev us in the battle phase. It would have been the same outcome because we did have smashing ground. So it would have been the same either way. We just smashing the other one instead of the big one. Uh, the big one, but you know it's still better to stop the attack if possible. I don't know. Maybe it's not. I don't fucking know. I literally don't know. I literally don't even know. Maybe it's just the same either way. Maybe he shouldn't have chained it. Maybe he should have done it in the draw phase. I don't. I don't know. I literally don't even know. Anyway, we clear both red meds, so we're not drowning under the card advantage just yet. We have prohibition which we're basically forced to play here to name Phantom of Chaos. Because if he has Phantom of Chaos, he can just normal that, copy Red Med, bring out Dark Horse, and we just lose. So I have to name it. And then I'm going to set Mirror Force, because if he attacks me, then I want to Mirror Force him. Uh, and if he Typhoons, then all right. I'd rather him Typhoon the Mirror Force than the Prohibition, basically. Uh, if he Typhoons the Prohibition, summons Phantom, copies Red Med, brings out Horus, then at least I can Mirror Force his two monsters, provided he summons the Horus in attack position. I don't set the mind crush because there's no reason to set it into heavy storm. It's not chainable because we have no other cards in our hand. You can't activate mind crush unless you have another card in your hand. Here he activates trade in pitching the dark creator. This was a greedy play from him because he does have that phantom, but he can't summon it. He can't set it. He does have dark armed, but he's stuck at four darks. So really insane hand from the opponent. I mean, they had future fusion. They had dark armed. They had card destruction. They had deck dev that was live like they have literally everything like this is the nuts basically besides a norlaris on top of it trade in gold sarcophagus is going to search for giant trunade probably trying to set up for that phantom turn that big phantom otk turn so i'm like okay that's good for us because we have mind crush and mind crush can name that giant trunade what he probably should have done was gold sark for something like red eyes wyvern because he knows we have mind crush because he saw my hand because of the deck dev so yeah, passes the turn, we draw brain control, we set mind crush, we pass the turn. He summons five-headed dragon in defense, totally chill, passes the turn. We draw a typhoon, which is literally best possible draw here, because it gives us an out to that five-headed dragon, even through like something like a cold wave or a heavy storm. So I set the typhoon. He gets to add the giant trunade, but we do get to mind crush the giant trunade. Uh, here he goes to the main phase, rotas for dark greffer, normals dark greffer, pitches, sends plague, stacks for plague, Synchros into Bryonic, Bryonic pitches, bounces my Typhoon, and I am going to chain that on Mir on Future Fusion. Now, he knows this set here is Mirror Force, so that means he's going to have to bounce another card, but um, he does know that that's the Mirror Force, so it's best not to priority bounce both of them, because he knows if, if the first one doesn't resolve, then the other card is Mirror Force, and he can just play around it. Thankfully, our card was a chainable Space Typhoon. We were able to remove that five-headed dragon, and we aren't taking five bajillion damage here, so yeah. He attacks for 23. We do take 23 and then he card destructions my two cards in order to remove that brain control and that mirror force that could potentially out his bryonic i think this is an okay play um although you do have to consider that if i just brain control the bryonic and then i pitch a card to bounce it it's a two for one so maybe it's better to save the card destruction all things considered given what my opponent has resolved this game uh decta future fusion five-headed dragon like literally multiple red eyes darkness metals trade in bryonic all of the stuff that he's resolved we should not be ahead cards yet we are here we are we draw royal oppression we're just forced to pass he attacks for 2300 says fuck it your back row isn't real passes the turn we draw sirocco and now we have sirocco kalut to get over the bryonic and take over this game so we pitch this the kalut to the bryonic pass the turn opponent draws a card passes the turn we hit for 2000 and i'm not going to play around heavy storm i'm just going to set bottomless and pass You'll notice I have Heavy Storm in my deck post board. The reason is because Royal Decree is too crushing. We do need an out to it. And it can also out Future Fusion in those situations that we saw before. Now you guys are going to see the power of Prohibition here. He passes the turn. We attack for 2,000. 
yet again we do draw avarice which is kind of a brick but if we draw like a blizzard or something we can synchro and then avarice afterward pass the turn opponent draws passes and we draw a lethal shura so we're going to summon that activate the effect to pump it up to play around Trigodia, and then attack directly for 2800 and as you can see in his hand god damn prohibition does a lot of work this card is insane it like it puts entire matchups like if there's a matchup that's like relying on one card or just one effect to go off in order to net a meaningful advantage in this case phantom of chaos prohibition is just gonna it's gonna give you the world it's legit gonna give you the world it's like one of the best cyborg cards and i wanted to showcase this match because of that so yeah we are able to take this game and take the match despite going down game one and what i think is probably a bad matchup for us um we were able to you know come back and, and take control of it he had a nut start too going first with future fusion is just is just insane but you know sometimes sometimes just stronger i'm just just a powerful duelist all right next match is versus pio Monat montan pio montano it's hard to read because their names are like sideways you know uh we win the rock paper scissors which is really nice and we open up with basically a classic hand for this deck which is going to summon green gadget search for red gadget set bottomless and pass now if they summon anything that can get over green gadget we will be able to bottomless trap hole it they summon nothing and so we are able to continue to commit our gadgets and i am going to attack here because i have kalut pleasure i can come back from gores he drops battle fader which is just a hard minus one so we're straight up up now going first so we have the plus one from going first we have two gadget searches under our belt and he's lost a battle fader so we functionally have right now nine cards to his six after the draw he draws for turn he's going to go for an enemy controller to take our gadget and that's one card that he has spent on a gadget and not on one of our black wings he's going to go ahead and sacrifice for caius target our other gadget and that's going to trade for the bottomless so we've basically traded just bottomless for battle fader caius and enemy controller because if you can see from our opponent they have four cards and we're about to draw up to seven now that's why the gadgets are so insanely good because they apply that pressure they say you're forced to act especially against frog decks you force your opponent to do something they're forced to waste their resources on your little guys like what happened here and then when they do that you just have insane advantage and a handful of blackwing monsters to just beat your opponent it's like basically i'm playing black wings and you're playing frogs but i got seven cards and you have four like that's the only difference you know what i mean here continue the train just summon yellow gadget we've already searched both our greens so we're just going to apply pressure with the gadget see if we can force more of those cards out of his hand he's most likely going to have to commit a swap frog to get anything going with this hand so just attacking for 12 here is perfectly fine we don't need to commit any of our black wings into something like this trigodia or gores we can save our power cards for later basically pass the turn the frog deck is notoriously shit at otking you so i don't really need to commit anything he's going to attack over the yellow gadget and we do lose minus one here we do go minus one and that is kind of the disadvantage when you get to the tail end of the gadgets they do become kind of useless but they they did their job we softened up the opponent we've got the stuff he's gonna go main phase two sack for vanity's fiend gives us our plus one right back we would have been forced to spend cards on that Trigodia, but here he is just summoning the vanity's fiend maybe scared of machina fortress and that's another um another thing that's really cool about this deck is that people will be you know very eager to commit royal oppression very eager to commit things like vanity's fiend or fossil dino and then they'll realize you know that's not going to do anything against the black wings we have heavy storm we're just going to cast that get rid of the enemy controller getting value out of heavy storm versus frogs is hilarious we're going to summon green gadget once again we don't even need to summon the black wings here i kind of want to win the game without even showing him that we're playing black wings i go for smashing ground attack for 1400 and now we're just in a commanding lead. I mean, he's at two cards and we're at six. This is like exactly what you want uh, versus versus any deck. <laughs> like, <laughs> honestly, versus any deck, this is exactly what you want. He goes one for one, pitching Jinzo for Substitute. He does have a Ryza in his hand. He can sacrifice, go get Swap Frog here. Special summon out that Swap Frog, send the Treeborn. He thinks for a very long time here, basically telling me that his hand is an active card in this position, which is a tribute monster more likely than not. He could have tributed his Swap Frog targeted my green gadget but then he would have been left with nothing so he's basically forced to think here do i want to spend my last card on a gadget or do i want to bounce my swap frog and hopefully try to take over the game in a different way he likes to go this route and we draw our black whirlwind because our deck is super thinned we are just going to draw good shit for the rest of the game basically we go ahead and summon the shura at this point it's pretty safe to just go for game 
We know his last card is not something like um, Gorge because he would not have been thinking on his turn. And we know it's not Battle Fader because, again, he would not have been thinking on his turn. He would have normal summoned the Battle Fader and gone for a dupe block. He says, what the fuck here? Because we did reveal our final OTK push. But yeah, that's just how the deck works. This is like textbook, what I was thinking in my dream, and it just became a reality. Like, literally, you just soften them up with the gadgets and then attack them with the Black Wings. I think this deck is fucking legit. Like, <laughs> I don't normally say that. Like, I do normally say it because I, I don't really like playing jank shit, but I think this deck is legit. So game two, we've got Prohibition for Treeborn Frog. We've got Shrink, which can help us attack over Monarchs. But we did draw Vayu, which makes me think that in the future, I'm probably going to side out Vayu versus Frogs uh, because drawing it is ass. So I'm probably going to side it out versus Frogs. I'm not exactly certain my siding pattern versus Frogs. Um, for this match, I was uh, I had a different configuration on my sideboard. So basically, I'm, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking the sideboarding pattern for Frogs is going to be something like Double Prohibition, obviously for Treeborn. Double Rug and Trap Hole. I think all of these are great. Maybe Compulsory to help deal with Soul Exchange, Enemy Controller, Brain Controller. Pardon me. And then, depending on if they're Hero Frog or not, you might want different cards like Royal Oppression. You might want DD Crow. I, you, it just depends. It depends. You might even want Cypher Soldier, Kinetic Soldier to help deal with Absolute Zeros. It, it really depends on the build. It really depends on what you're staring down against and... I think the cards you want to side out are probably Vayu because this card is ass. You probably want to side out, I don't know, Heavy Storm Typhoon unless they have a billion back row. One Starlight Road. They usually don't have a lot of ways to nuke your field. They don't play Mirror Force and Torrential most often. Sometimes they do, but very rarely. It's usually just Heavy Storm. Well, Starlight Road plus Prohibition is nice to defend you against. Um, it's nice to defend you against Heavy Storm on your Prohibition. It's also fine because if they Solix into a Monarch and you have Starlight Road and Prohibition, you're just crying. Like, you're just actually crying. And then you can probably side out Pot of Avarice. Although I do think that there's some sort of merit to the grind game in this matchup. Uh, I think you can play a really strong grind game versus Frogs. And then Allure of Darkness is actually a card that I've I've been pretty uh, forward about siding out. Just because, like, if you're bringing out some of your Dark Monsters, you can put yourself lower on Darks that you actually want to banish to Allure. And so I think it's fine to side it out. Um, although it is nice to si uh, draw into your, your sideboard card. Sometimes you just draw it with no dark and it's just a brick in the early game. And versus frogs, bricking in the early game is not where you want to be. So this game, he starts off with uh, Swap Frog, Send Treeborn. We start off with Green Gadget, Search Red Gadget. We have Prohibition, Name Treeborn. We attack first though. We don't want to let him know. We don't want to let him know that we're going to Prohibition, Name Treeborn. Because then he might drop a Battle Fader. And I don't want him to drop that Battle Fader, so... I'm going to activate Prohibition, and I'm just going to pass. If he has a way to summon a Monarch here, it'll be like Soul Exchange, Target Prohibition, then we can just draw it again, which is exactly what happens, as you can see. He goes for Ryza. He tries to attack here, but I remind him that Soul Exchange says, you cannot conduct your battle phase the turn you activate it. He sets a back row and passes. Now, that back row is going to be a little bit annoying for us, but we have Shrink to help us get over this Ryza, so I'm going to go for the Red Gadget, Search Yellow Gadget, and then I'm just going to try to run over the Ryza with Shrink, he does activate enemy controller to switch us to defense though, which is a pretty strong play uh, because it keeps his Ryza in play and that means he can summon that Swap Frog and bounce his Ryza, which is really annoying. So I'm going to Prohibition named Treeborn Frog and set my Mirror Force so if he does go for that Swap Frog, uh, he can't attack over my Red Gadget if he bounces Ryza main one and if he goes for Battle Phase attack, we can Mirror Force the Ryza. Unfortunately for us, he does draw that Heavy Storm and he's able to clear both our Mirror Force and our Prohibition, so kind of tough. Kind of tough. He's going to Swap Frog, send the other Treeborn, attack with Ryza. Now, generally speaking here, you don't want to send the other Treeborn because you want to play around Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer, and you also want to play around Soul Release. So generally speaking, you don't want to send the second Treeborn yet. He's going to attack for a 1,000. And now he does know about our Yellow Gadget, and he does know that that can eat his Swap Frog. So he's going to bounce the Ryza pass. We do draw Brain Control. We have no conversion. This value is really annoying. Um, but it can present a starter for a big Bora push turn if we need to. So I'm going to go for the yellow gadget, search for green gadget, and just attack over the Swap Frog. We are going to get Ryza next turn, which sucks, but um, we can at least green gadget, keep up the card advantage, and shrink to run over the Ryza. So we're like not we're not just cooked here, but it is it is really brutal getting hit with Ryza multiple times in a game. Uh, not as bad as it would have been in, in other circumstances, uh, but I think it's fine. Uh, for us because we do have this gadget search red gadget and now i'm thinking like okay he's starting to get a little bit low if we can get him one more hit then maybe brain control bora value in the same turn with a gadget can be lethal so i attack 
I shrink his monster, 200. We need one more hit, though, for him to really be in that nice range where we can brain control Bayou Bora and then win. Uh, so we need to connect with the green gadget at least one more time. He's going to bring out Treeborn. He's going to set a back on pass. I'm like, hmm. Now we have Blizzard, and I'm like, hmm. That's not even that bad. Now we've got some real options because we can go for some big pierce turns. We can go for some big stuff. So I start thinking here. I'm like, do I want to special summon Bora? I'm like, there's a good chance he might be on Mirror Force. I'm just going to stick to my game plan, summon my gadget, search my other gadget, and then just, you know, soften up his position. Force the back row. If he's going to Mirror Force, do it now, you know? Force to use it on the two gadgets, and then I still have the Blackwing Monsters to go for that late game push. And here we did connect with the gadget. So everything that we wanted has come to fruition here. We were able to deal that 1400, and now we've got basically some certain combinations here we can go Vayu plus bora get a pierce turn in uh, or get 2500 in and then maybe blizzy into bryonic for the last 2300 you'll notice 2500 plus 2300 is exactly where he's sitting at right now so there's a lot of different ways we can piece together that win con having the yellow gadgets is also very nice too because it means we have excess cards in our hand to pitch to that bryonic when we inevitably go for it he just draws and passes the turn which tells me his back row is probably something like Threatening Roar, or he has something like Battle Fader in his hand. I am just going to continue the game plan. Summon Gadget and Pressure. He activates Scapegoat. Now, I think for a very long time here, because if he can answer all three of my gadgets, then I should kill three of the tokens. But if he can only answer two of my gadgets, then I should only kill two of the tokens. Because next turn, I can Summon Blizzy, Special Bora, Synchro into, um, synchro into Armed Wing, and then Armed Wing plus Bora is actually 4,500 over two different tokens. And that puts him at 300, and then I have Brain Control to eventually close things out. So I'm thinking, okay, if he can only if he can only answer two of the two of the gadgets, it's best to kill only two of the tokens, and that's what I do. I kill only two of the tokens. And plus, one of the only ways he can actually kill three of my gadgets is with the card Brain Control, specifically with Brain Control. And if he has Brain Control, that means he has to pay eight down to 4,000, and then my game plan can come to fruition in a couple of different ways. Like, I can summon Bora, Pierce one, and then next turn, Blizzy back the Bora and go from there. We are also going to get perfect info thanks to this Trap Dushu draw, which is a really nice draw. So we're going to go for Trap Dushu here. We're going to see his hand, and we have a couple of options. Um, unfortunately, what we have to do is we have to take the Cyber Dragon. Um... We're not able to take the Tragodia, which can pose a threat. But thankfully, we are able to take the Cyber Dragon, because otherwise he would have had a 4,000 Chimera Tech, which would have been a very difficult threat for us to beat. We do have Brain Control, but we would not be able to cast it due to being at uh, 600 life points after the Chimera Tech connects directly. So thankfully for us, we did have Trap Dash Shoot. Now, any Trap card here would have been good for us, uh, just to take the Cyber Dragon or deal with the Cyber Dragon, but... Uh, Dust Shoot is probably the best one because it also does tell us a little bit about his hand. He's going to bring back that Treeborn. We do chain to the Treeborn, the Dust Shoot, because if he only has one Monarch, we want that Treeborn sitting in play. It gives us another target for us to pierce. We're going to shuffle away that Cyber Dragon. He brings out the Treeborn Frog. He brain controls one of the gadgets, and he makes an interesting play here. This is actually, I think, a smart play on his part. He attacks with the gadget first to play around Tragodia, which I think is a really good play. He recognizes that our deck could be playing Tragodia. And so he attacks with the gadget first. I would have definitely messed this up and summoned the Caius, and I would have lost to a Tragodia. So smart play from our opponent. He attacks over the yellow gadget. Uh, we take 200, and then he Caius is the red gadget. And then on our turn, we draw Royal Oppression. So we know the last three cards in his hand. Burial, which is completely dead because we're not banishing the Treeborns. It makes sense that he has the Burial because he went for double Treeborn super early. Um, Soul Exchange, which is partially dead. Uh, Soul Exchange plays into our game plan because it cuts off his battle phase, so it just gives us the initiative back, and it puts the Bora in the graveyard for us, which is exactly where we want it. So, because we know Soul Exchange and Tragodia is like most likely his only play on the following turn, we're just going to summon Bora and pierce a token. He's going to take 1700 here. Now, he could special summon Tragodia, but that means his Soul Exchange is now a dead card. And so, does he really want to do that? Like, does he want to cut off Soul Exchange when potentially I could have Kalut? To defend my Bora through um, Caius and through Tragodia, he probably doesn't want to do that. So I think he's just going to go for the uh, take 17, don't special summon Tragodia. And then on our turn, I am going to set a back row to sort of say like, ooh, I could have something, you know, like kind of kind of fake him out. If he does draw a Monarch, he might go for that soul exchange, sacrifice our Bora, and then use the Monarch to target my back row. Uh, either way, he's basically forced to play into Kalut or Icarus. Whichever one he wants to choose to play around here, it's going to hurt him 
Uh, if he plays around Icarus, it's a little bit better for him. He can attack with Caius and then run over the Bora. But either way, he has no way to stop the Armed Wing that's coming next turn. And he has no way to get rid of this token because the Scapegoat tokens can't be tributed for a Tribute Summon. So he Soul Exchanges, targets the Bora, sacrifices a Treeborn, Tribute sets the Trigodia, passes the turn because he can't attack. Uh, like I said, I had a different siding pattern in this matchup. The mas I had Mask of Restrict in place of pulling the rug. I ended up switching them after this match because I had the idea that pulling the rug is going to be better against more matchups. And so uh, just imagine that this is a pulling the rug for all intents and purposes. We summon Blizzy, and then we special summon Outbora, and then we synchro into Armed Wing, and then we go for the game shot. So yeah, that's just like textbook how this deck works. You summon the gadgets, you soften up your opponent, you force them to act into the gadgets, and then when you've taken a little bit of damage and they've taken a little bit of damage, it favors you because you have more cards and you have Blackwing monsters, which are just the best monsters in the game. So cool. That's going to be the uh, match there. The third match I played with this deck was versus Binary Boy against Binary Boy. Um, he is newer to Edison, but he's playing a meta deck. So I do want to talk about this matchup as it's going along because I think it's important to reflect on this and say, oh, could he have done this differently? Could he have done this differently? Is there certain things that could have changed here and there? We do get to go first and we do start off with gadgets. So we're going to start off with the gadgets. That's the game plan. Gadget, search gadget, set two. We have the road to defend our back row. So we're big chilling. So this game, our opponent is playing black wings. So he has a lot of opportunities here to do some cool shit, right? He has Shura attack the green gadget and then he can grab um he can grab what is that card bor uh not bora vayu he can grab vayu or he can open up with a bora and then attack the green gadget on top of that he could do something like summon blizzy special bora but that's pretty bad into two back rows so you don't really want to be doing that i think what he should have done here was summon bora and attack the green gadget because that's like the worst card in his hand and if it dies like he's probably pretty happy with that trading with the removal spell and not shura um and we probably would have been forced to mirror force it or we would have at least had to consider mirror forcing it I wouldn't have Mirror Force Bora because I would have wanted to tempt him into setting an Icarus attack, and then I would have tried to get a 2 for 1 Mirror Force on the next turn, and then if he chains Icarus, we can Starlight Road. So I think that that's, that's the game plan I would have gone for. Plus, if we draw our own Shura, eating Boras is really nice. He goes ahead and summons Shura, so he gets pretty greedy here. He, goes, he leads with his best card. Usually in Edison format, into back row, you don't want to lead with your best card. It's just not what you want to do. That's kind of the game plan of our deck as well, is... Don't lead with your best card. Lead with these kind of shitty cards that replace themselves, and then you have the best cards for later. Uh, he attacks, we go Mirror Force, sets back or passes the turn. We draw another Kalute, so that's going to be really good for us because we can Kalute and then activate the other Kalute. I'm going to summon Red Gadget, search for Yellow Gadget, uh, and attack for 2700. This is also really nice because it just plays around Bottomless Trap Hole and gets in the chip damage. We pass the turn. He finds Soroko, so he can go for a couple of different plays here. He can summon Blizzy. He can summon Sirocco, Bora, Bora. He can do a lot of different stuff, but he's trying to play around, I think, Bottomless Trap Hole because he has Bottomless Trap Hole. Normally when someone is a newer player, or you can tell they're a newer player, they play around the cards that are in their hand. <laughs> and that's something you can notice. Now, what he should have done here was probably go for the Sirocco just to check if there was a Bottomless, but it is really bad if it runs into a spot removal spell for him. So I think he just has to go for the Blizzy and bring out the Shura. Um, but he thought it summoned it in attack position, which you can't do. It has to summon it in defense position. And then he switches it to defense. And upon realizing this, what he probably should have done was synchro um, into Bryonic and just see if that works. Because if that works, then he can just run over a gadget or he can bounce my back or run over a gadget and put me in a bad spot. Um, and if it doesn't work, then uh, he's going to take a million, but... At least he can priority bounce the gadgets if he wants to. Maybe pitch a Bora or some shit. I don't know. I just think he should have synchroed here. Just because he has bottomless, so I don't know. He doesn't attack. Uh, he holds up the Kalut that I know he probably has, which is fine. I'm cool trading a gadget for a Kalut. I've always been cool trading a gadget for a Kalut. So we're going to red gadget, run over the plus one Shura. I thought he might have Icarus attack, so that's why I played a little conservatively, not summoning my own Kalut to play around his. I attack here. He doesn't use his Kalut because he's a newer player and probably doesn't want to spend it there or probably doesn't realize he can. Um, but had he spent it there, it would have been totally fine for us because we did find the Deep Prison for his next normal. And we do have Starlight Road for Icarus. So we're probably just winning this game straight up. Had he made Bionic and run over our monster and like bounce stuff, we would have been forced to do something like Kalut, attack with Kalut. Um, but even that is fine. You know, like he would have had Sirocco, but we would have had Deep Prison and we would have been fine. So either way, we would have been in a decent spot. He summons Gale. 
He could have done a bunch of different things here. Um, he could have like taken a gamble that I only have D prison set. He could have gone Sirocco, Special Gale, have one of my guys make Thought Ruler, and then just taken that gamble, uh, which is actually not a bad play here. But again, we still have Kalut, <laughs> Kalut, attack over if he makes that Thought Ruler. And if he doesn't make Thought Ruler, whatever it is, loses to the D prison. So he specials Gale, he goes for an Armor Master, and he correctly deduces that we may have D prison and just doesn't attack. We're kind of in an awkward spot, but eventually we'll find a tuner. We can just pass. He goes Heavy Storm. We have Starlight Road. I try to explain to him here why he can't bottomless the Stardust. So I'll take this as an opportunity to explain it to you guys as well. You basically can't summon, or you can't bottomless unless the last thing to happen is the summon. Because it needs to respond directly to the summon window. So for example, if I activate Call of the Haunted Chain Link 1 and I summon a monster that's 1500 or more attack, you can bottomless trap hole it if that makes sense, because the last thing to happen is that monster getting summoned. Um, but let's say I go uh, Upstart Goblin, and I chain Call of the Haunted. Call of the Haunted resolves, I summon my monster, and then Upstart resolves. You can't interrupt a chain resolving. You can't activate cards within a chain resolving. So the last thing to happen is actually Upstart Goblin resolving. And so Bottomless Trap Hole can't respond to the resolution of Upstart Goblin. So you can't Bottomless Trap Hole a monster that was summoned Call of the Haunted. This is the same thing, basically. Um, if So, Chain Link 1 is Heavy Storm. Chain Link 2 is Starlight Road. Starlight Road is going to negate the effect of Heavy Storm, but it doesn't negate the activation. And so, uh, Heavy Storm being Chain Link 1, a negated Heavy Storm is still the last thing to happen, not the monster being summoned. And so, you can't Bottomless Trap Hole here. You also cannot Torrential Tribute here. Um, yeah, Bottomless Trap Hole and... Um, Torrential Tribute are functionally when you can effects, so they can miss timing unless the uh, unless the last thing to happen is the summon. So you can the, I don't know if that makes sense, but he's a newer player. I explained it to him. It, a lot of you guys are probably newer players, so I'm explaining it to you. Uh, but yeah, you can't really bottomless here. Now he asks if he attacks Stardust, if his guy dies, and he wouldn't. Um, and I said, yeah, that's how that would work if you could attack into the Stardust, but we do have that D prison. And uh, yeah, that's going to be game one. Game two, we side how we planned on siding versus Black Wings, which is compulsory in the two Sirocos. And yeah, that's pretty much it. He allures, he draws two new cards, he banishes Sirocco, he summons Shura, he sets Icarus, and sets his Space Typhoon as well. Now, if you're a newer player, you should probably set your Solemn Judgment because you just don't want to get blown out by Heavy Storm. That's just something you, you should probably put down uh, ASAP in this matchup. Yes. It does suck to pay 4,000 life points, but not much is really beating you through um, through this stuff here. So if you can defend yourself, then you should. We're going to get our two-for-one Heavy Storm, which is busted. I'm going to go for Black Whirlwind, Normal Bora, Activate Whirlwind, and Search Kalut. And this is going to look like a really weird play to a lot of you guys, because Bottomless Trap is very good versus Black Wings. Kalut is, you know, obviously a way we can fight through the Shura if we want to. But if you look at what we're looking at, which is basically he summoned a Shura with these two cards in the back row. Um, neither of these cards answer a Sirocco, so that means he summoned the Shura. I mean, if I was playing against a player who was more familiar, he summoned the Shura knowing that in the mirror match, he could get Sirocco pumped over if he doesn't have um, an additional piece of defense, which would be something like Kalut. Even Kalut here doesn't really stop Sirocco, so I don't even know what I'm talking about. But basically, the best play is to not attack with Bora, and it's also to not set the bottomless trap hole, and it's also to just let the Shura kill the Bora. So yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to let the Shura kill the Bora. We're going to take 100, special summon our Trag. Get value out of our Trag while we still can. Because if we draw a level 4 monster, we can steal his Shura. We're pretty sure he doesn't have another Icarus. Although he could be. He could have saved it, not set it with his uh, first one. Um, But this is going to get us the best value out of Tragodia, basically. He's going to set 4, pass the turn. We're going to draw D Prison. And Tragodia is going to go up to 2400. So because he set two new cards, I'm like, okay, maybe he has Icarus. So we can go Tragodia attack Shura, and that's going to force Icarus. I'm pretty sure he doesn't have Kalut at this point, because he would have to priority Kalut, use it on in the damage. Well, actually, he might still have Kalut. He might still have Kalut. But if he does, then main phase two, we can go um, just set our trap cards and be fine uh, after searching with the Whirlwind. We're able to run it over, and so here I summon Kalut, but he does have that Torrential Tribute which is a really nice one to have in the mirror match here. It's going to work out really well for him. That, be, that being said, we are up cards. We do have Pot of Avarice. If we can find another monster, that'll get us a fifth. 
Uh, any gadget will get us a fifth, and any Blackwing that isn't Blizzard will get us a fifth. So, yeah, we set our two. Or we just set... Actually, we just set one. We just set Bottomless because if he has a normal summon, we'll want to Bottomless it and not lose out too hard to another Icarus. Although I'm fairly certain an Icarus would have gotten used there instead of Torrential Tribute. Um, he's going to try to banish the two, but there's no level five Blackwing Synchro, so he has to pass. We do draw Blizzard, which is funny because it's kind of the only one that won't get us a fifth, but... Technically, it does as long as our Synchro hits the graveyard. He goes for a Legacy in our draw step. Uh, we go for Blizzard, bring back the Bora Synchro into Goyo. He goes for Solemn, which is perfect because that means the monster is hitting the grave and we can Avarice shuffle them back. I did side out the Vayu in this matchup, so that's why we did not search it off of Black Whirlwind. Um, we draw two, we draw another Whirlwind and another Blizzy. This Blizzy is not great because it doesn't search anything. We have nothing in our graveyard, but it's fine. Eventually, we'll find something. And we still have a great position here because we have the Whirlwinds and we have the removal spells. And he has three cards he has to play into our two removal spells. So he's going to summon Shura. We're going to bottomless that. Don't want to worry about an Icarus attack. He sets a backward passes. We draw another removal, which is perfect. We'll just set Deep Prison pass. He summons Bora, attacks. We got Deep Prison. Does he have Icarus? No, he doesn't. We find Shura. And I'm just going to shotgun that uh, into the Devil Whirlwind. And that's going to resolve. So we're going to search Bora and search Kalut. And we're just going to win. How we found gadgets, it would have been just as good. How we found whatever else, it would have been just as good. And then here the Shura can connect and deal lethal damage. Uh, no, it can't, actually, because I searched Bora and not double Kalut. But, uh, I mean, it's functionally, it's functionally game. Yep. He's just going to brain control, get in some chip shots, pass. We are going to summon Kalut, search Gale, search Blizzy, special the Gale, synchro into Bryonic, and then use Bryonic to bounce the last back row and attack for game uh, because Torrential is gone, so that's pretty much safe into anything. Yeah, and that's going to be that. Um, the opponent was newer, but like if you look at his draws, the biggest differences he could have gone for was setting the Solemn Judgment turn one. It would have changed the game a lot. We could go back and like reflect on how the game would have been different had that been the case. Um, we could also go back and reflect on like what we would have done differently with Trag, for example. Like Let's say we had um, we would go for Heavy Storm, he Solemns it, and I'm like, okay, I'll just pass. He'll play into my Trag, and I'll have a huge Trag, and he can't Icarus because I'll only have one card in play, and then um, he'll have to find a way to deal with the Trag, and we can use the Trag to maybe steal the Shura, we could use the Trag to do a bunch of different stuff, and um, yeah, I think that the game would have been different, but I think it still would have favored us because we had that Haymaker in Tragodia, and we also had the Black War one in the late game, so I think it would have been fine, plus he would have started at 4,000, so... Uh, slight differences here and there, but I think that our game plan worked out really well. The cards we sided in worked out really well. The compulsory, well, it would have been good had the game gone longer. And the Pot of Avarice gave us the grind potential in the top deck war, which is basically what you want to get into in the Blackwing Mirror. It's, it's almost always how Blackwing Mirrors go, is they go into a top deck mirror match, and then you just have more haymakers, because you have Pot of Avarice, you have gadgets, you have ways to keep this steady stream of monsters and pressure going. The next match I want to show you is up against Clanger. We lose the Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is kind of tough. But, alas, we open up... Okay, no, we, we won we won the Rock, Paper, Scissors. My bad, my bad, my bad. We won the Rock, Paper, Scissors. I don't know what I'm talking about. I summon the Yellow Gadget. I search for another Gadget. This hand is decent. This hand is decent into just about any meta deck. Alas, the opponent is not playing a meta deck. They're playing our worst matchup, Glads. And I'm going to show you guys why this matchup is so bad. So, yeah, it tags over the yellow gadget. He could tag out if he wanted to. Um, on our turn, we're pretty much just, like, forced to play into things. We don't really have any sort of way to break serve. We don't have any way to really break up the back row. We're just super behind from this position. We summon the Shura, and he does have the removal spell for the Shura, so we lose the Shura. We set Solemn, and he does have the Typhoon for the Solemn, so we're just falling really, really far behind. He goes ahead and summons another Laquari off the top. I don't know if it was off the top or not. He shuffled his hand. But we're going to take a lot of damage. This is the best monster in the matchup because it is 1800 and it gets over just about everything. And we're not playing stuff like Sirocco in this. He is going to tag out into Rediari and Bestiari to make a Geyserus. So he is going to make a minus one Geyserus, which is good for us. But again, we need a way to break through these back row or we're just going to lose to them. And we just don't draw a way to break through it. We have Black Whirlwind, but he has a summon stop. And so, yeah, that's going to be that. We could have, let's say he doesn't have a summon stop. Let's say he has like a War Chariot or something. We can go like Shura, Search, Kalut. And then we can like pass and then he's forced to attack and then we have double Kalut. So he has to have double chariot, but um, yeah, it's not good either way. We lose game one pretty bad just because he has perfect mix of removal and threats and his threat was Laquari and not something like a fucking Mermillo 
or whatever. And he top decks best Yari, so he's able to blow up our whirlwind main phase too. So any comeback potential here is just gone completely. Uh, we did have comeback potential if he didn't find best Yari. We could go Kalut, summon, uh, activate whirlwind, search Gale, special Gale. Uh, we could have the Geyserus, force the chariot, figure things out from there. But unfortunately, he top deck best Yari again. So yeah, that's going to be game one. Game two is a bit of a grind, if I remember correctly. Game two, we open up with the, yeah, just the stuff. We got Heavy Storm, so we can break into the back row. Um, and we've got a gadget. So we have our stream of monsters. We've also got Whirlwind plus a Blackwing. So this hand's just good. This hand's just good. We have removal spells. We have monsters. We have removal for back row. That's pretty much everything you can ask for versus Glads. I'm going to set Shrink and Heavy Storm. Because if he sets two cards, I'm just going to flip the Heavy Storm. And if he summons a Glad and tries to attack, I want to damage step Shrink him to play around Book of Moon. So yeah, he doesn't summon a, ga a Glad, and we draw another removal spell, which is just excellent. I'm going to go ahead and Heavy Storm. He's going to chain Trap Stun. Uh, here, you actually shouldn't chain Trap Stun. You should just pass priority. Because if I activate a chainable Trap card, um, you would want to chain the Trap Stun to it then. Uh, but if I don't activate a chainable trap, uh, trap card, then it doesn't matter if you chain the Trap Stun or not. So you want to pass priority there. Um, if you chain the trap stun first, then it gives me an opportunity to chain my potentially chainable trap card, like Legacy or something like that, of that nature, and that's bad for you. Here we go, Whirlwind, Sacrifice for Sirocco, Search Shura, Attack for 2000. I figured it's best just to put the strongest monster in play. We can figure out the gadgets later, uh, set two and pass. He summons Gale, halves our Sirocco. I just let this happen because we don't have a way to stop it, and I'd rather save my trap hole and my D prison for actual gladiator monsters. He sets four and passes. We summon Kalu. We search Blizzy. We attack over the Gale, dealing 100. Uh, he deprisons the Kalu. He attacks for 1300. You'll notice in these matchups, this is like the most anti Blackwing deck I've ever seen because he just has 1500 trap cards and one guy. <laughs> but that's okay because we can out the one guy pretty easily using our repeatable threats. We summon Red Gadget, search Yellow, attack into Gale. And uh, we're pretty much set up here to take over this game. We've got a bunch of monsters. He's got four trap cards, but we've got way more than four monsters thanks to the gadgets being what they are. He's got Bestiari. We're just going to trap hold that shit. He's going to call the haunt of the Bestiari. He's going to attack. We are going to try to deprison. He's going to chain Compulsory to put it back in his hand, but, you know, that's, what, one, two, three, one, two cards for two. Two for two, kind of what we expected. Passes the turn. We summon Bora. We get a search with Whirlwind. Bora is stronger than the, the guy the thing the best yari so that's why i summoned it i go ahead and just pass i don't want to attack into a d prison because i don't want to give him a chance to tag he summons laquari off the top so he top decks like a lucker and he attacks over my uh bora but thankfully the best yari is in the deck or in the hand so he can't actually tag into it he grabs hoblimus i believe no he grabs ready Ari to banish the bora to play around lizzie which is fine we draw smashing ground which is like one of the best cards in this matchup i wish we had a third but we just don't have the space for it Summon Shura, search for Black, uh, Black Whirlwind, search Bora, special summon Gale, have his monster, attack with both to play around more spot removal, D-Prisons, and then we're going to special summon out Kalut, attack for 1300, I sided out the Vayu, that's why we're grabbing Kalut here, otherwise you'd grab Vayu, you'd synchro Armor Master, then make Stardust, but yeah, we sided it out. We're going to attack for 1400, and then main phase 2, we're going to synchro into Bryonic, pitch Yellow Gadget to bounce the Whirlwind to protect it from a potential Tiger Geyserous nonsense play. He's going to summon E-Quest, attack into the Bryonic, shrink it and then tag into Mermillo to blow up the Shura. No, he's going to tag into Hoplimus here. But this doesn't matter at this point. I mean, we just have like multiple lethal threats. We have Whirlwinds, Normal Bora, Search Kalu, Smashing Ground, and then yeah, it's just game through anything. So going first, we had a lot of initiative. We were able to break. We had Heavy Storm. We had a really good draw. Going second, we have a good draw here too as well, but we don't have Heavy Storm. So he's just going to be able to spam trap cards, and that's basically what's happening here. We summon Red Gadget, we activate the effect, and that's going to resolve, so no Chariot down there. Uh, I'm going to set four at this point, pass the turn. He attacks. I thought about letting this attack through because I can oppression this, but I decided to deprison. And in hindsight, this was a misplay. I actually should have let that attack through. That being said, though, he could have just chosen not to tag, and then we would have been left in a really awkward spot. So I figured it's probably best just to deprison it. So yeah, here comes normal Mermillo, main phase two, which basically telegraphs a shrink and a chariot. Sets three more back row, so he just opens up everything. 
Um, we could summon another gadget. We could summon a Kalut here. There's a bunch of different things we could do. I actually think in hindsight, this is an error on my part. I should have summoned the Kalut to play around Chariot. But alas, here we are. He wore Chariot's the yellow gadget. I decide to attack. Uh, he shrinks my gadget. And then he tags into something, or he tries to tag. We have Royal Oppression. And then we have Solemn Judgment. So now he has no monsters. He has no way to get his thing going. The Mermillo actually is shuffled back here for cost. And Oppression can't destroy cards that are uh, in the... It doesn't destroy the Mermillo for whatever reason. He draws and he top decks Hoplomus, which is really fucking annoying. Because, like, had he drawn just about anything else, I think we would have been fine. But this is why Hoplomus is so good right now in the meta. Decks are super aggressive. They're going to be summoning, searching. And I basically have to play around Morphing Jar. I know he's 100% playing it because of how many fucking trap cards he's playing. So I have to attack. And it's just fucking Hoplomus. And I'm like, bruh. And I'm, I take 700. I'm forced to bottomless his next top deck, which is insane as well. We draw a second Royal Oppression. So we brick. Uh, we draw a search gadget, try to thin the deck, try to find something more meaningful. Heavy storm, space typhoon would be great here. Set the oppression. He sets another back row, draws another trap card, passes. Uh, we find smashing ground and it's the perfect out to protect his hoplomus. So three insanely good top decks in a row from the opponent. After drawing basically the nuts, um, which is Laquari set five. Um, but yeah, that works out well in the opponent's favor. Summon Gale, have the monster. So another one of top deck. He's able to have the green gadget. Now, what he should do here is actually attack over the yellow gadget, but he attacks over the green gadget. Trying to put us low enough that we can't use the suppression enough. We draw Shura. I go ahead and summon green gadget to run over the Gale, just because I don't want to run into bottomless trap hole, and we absolutely have to out this Gale, or it's going to beat us. And then he top decks another fucking monster that can run over my guys, which is really annoying. So he attacks over this. We take 400. Draw for turn. We draw brain control with no conversion, which is fucking lovely. Summon Shura, attack, he's got Shrink, or no, he's got D-Prison. He does have another Shrink, which we would have been able to play through with Kalut, but because he has specifically D-Prison there, we can't connect with the Shura, but it makes sense. I mean, they probably play like three Prison, two Bottomless, and both of those would have stopped the Shura. We are going to take some more damage here. At this point, he should have considered flipping the Hoplomus, attacking with both, and then he would have been able to actually tag, successfully tag with one of them uh, through Royal Oppression, because he would have dealt enough to put me down to only one activation. And then we draw fucking Starlight Road, the only one that we left in. Uh, so yeah, we, we bricked pretty hard this game. We didn't draw the right cards to play through his back row. We saw all six gadgets. We saw double Royal Oppression. It was just like an awkward combination of cards to draw. Uh, the most awkward. And he also drew like three, four runner runner perfect top decks, including that Torrential, which basically confirms that nothing bad can happen to us. We go ahead and attack here. We use Kalut. I don't think you can shrink and calc, but even if you could, Kalut would be chain link one, shrink would be chain link two, and he would lose his shrink. So I'm pretty sure you can't shrink and calc. So he just takes the damage. Um, it would have been better for us if he could. He sets another Dust Tornado. We draw Space Typhoon, which can out our own Royal Oppression. I don't know why I set the Brain Control and the Starlight Road. I just wanted to bluff something, but in hindsight, I should have set neither because it ends up being awkward for us because we can't like commit multiple cards here. Uh, we just have to keep passing. We can't attack into the Hoplomus. Um, yeah, it just gets annoying. I have to blind Typhoon. We do hit a nice one with the D Prison. Sack for Sirocco. He goes Torrential. I go Road. He pays 8 to the Oppression. Uh, unfortunately, because I had the Brain Control set, I could not have saved my Typhoon. I was forced to blind do it, and I would have been able to chain Typhoon to my own Oppression there and get a Stardust and win the game. But because I set my Brain Control like an idiot, I fucking lose. So, yeah. Tough game, tough game, because everything kind of just went wrong um, in a lot of different circumstances. And it's it's rare that this happens. Um, usually the, usually only one of these things going wrong is easy enough to play out of, but when you're playing against Glads, you kind of need the perfect storm for Glads to beat you. And uh, that's kind of what happens here, unfortunately. And as you can see, like he drew fucking so much back row. Like there's fucking 10... No, 9 plus however much this is, 15 back row and like 5 monsters the whole game. So he drew like a perfect mix of like back row and Hoplomus right when he needed it in order to not lose this game. And we drew the perfect mix of no Blackwing monsters and no Heavy Storm and awkwardly setting our own brain control and doubles of Royal Oppression with double Starlight Road. I actually ended up not citing, in, citing out one of the rows I should have. That's a mistake on my part. Um, yeah, so we, we misplayed a couple of ways, sideboarding and 
yeah, things kind of fell apart. We probably should have won this game uh, in hindsight, but alas, here we are losing to Glass, which is just going to happen. You know, some percentage of the games you're just going to get obliterated on multiple fronts. The next game I'm going to show you guys is versus People Felipe. I actually do think this matchup is very bad, by the way, too, because they have Chariot to stop your gadget pressure, and then they just kind of like own you more or less because you're just behind. Uh, so we go second this game. This is the match where we go second. He starts off with set monster, set back row pass. We draw into Vayu, and I'm like, hmm, gadget time. Summon green gadget. <laughs> Search for red gadget. I don't want a heavy storm into this one lone back row. I actually want to save the heavy storm for when I start going for the black wing plays. And the gadgets play really well into back row as it is. So we're going to attack. We'll take 600 here, which kind of sucks, but it's fine. I'll just set shrink and pass. If he summons a monster, tries to attack, I'll damage step shrink. I don't want to set road and judgment because I want to set them after I heavy storm. He summons Gilman. This is about sequencing your cards properly. Shrink is the best card to set into your own heavy storm here. I'm going to shrink his Gilman. So I'm learning a bit more about his deck. It's like a reptile diva, maybe hero deck. We don't know yet. He goes ahead and sets another back row. We draw smashing ground. Now we can smash ground. I'm going to take my two for two on heavy storm. And the reason I'm going to take my, or not two for two, two for one on heavy storm. The reason I'm going to take my two for one is because I do just want to get the road and the judgment set. Um, I'm not going to go for any major push here, but I'll take a two for one. I'm not going to leave that on the table. I'm going to go ahead and gadget, search for yellow gadget. We could smashing ground here to start applying pressure, but he just searches for another one and then sets it. So there's really no reason to do that when drawing any Blackwing monster kind of gets us there anyway. He passes a turn and this stalemate kind of favors us because we can just keep summoning the gadgets, keep thinning our deck, keep drawing good cards like Deep Prison, pass the turn. He sets a back row, passes the turn. We draw Shura, which is really nice. Just going to, again, search. When we draw Kalut, that Shura can finally get over the guard now. We'll figure it out from there. He finds Ocean, he attacks, and I actually just let this attack go through because um, I need to make space on my field <laughs> to summon another gadget. We draw a Pot of Avarice, which is great. It's like basically the best draw at this point. I summon Shura, he goes for Torrential, and we have that Starlight Road. We can now attack over the Gardena. It is a little bit awkward, we won't get the Shura summon, but it's totally fine. We'll clear his board. He searches for the Reptilian Naga, which will buy him at least another turn in this game. He'll activate Trigodia. But because we preserved our smashing ground to this point in the game, we can trade smashing ground with an actual meaningful threat, which is Trigodia. So we're going to remove that guy and pass the turn. Here, he's going to go for Miracle Fusion, which is fine. It is going to trade for our D Prison and Stardust, which sucks, but that's okay. The Stardust was free anyway, and we still have all the pressure in the world, plus Avarice to come back into this game if everything fails. He's going to summon Diva. Uh, just grab another Diva. His Gilman is gone. He's going to attack. We'll D Prison plus Stardust to negate the absolute zero effect. He'll pass the turn. We'll draw a Bora, we'll attack over the Diva, we'll special summon out a Gale. We'll Gale attack, or er, Yellow Gadget attack over the Diva, and then attack directly for 4,000 damage here, which is actually pretty big. Main phase 2, I'm going to synchro into Armor Master to make space on the field. And if this Armor Master dies, then our value plus the Armor Master can make um, Silver Winds, and we'll have Avarice to come back into the game as well. So we're just crushing at this point. He sets 2, we just summon Blizzy, Synchro, Bryonic. Bounce a monster, bounce one of the back row. We have Solemn Judgment for the last back row, and this is just going to be game. So that's going to be game one. Um, we sided, I don't remember how we sided in this matchup. I sided as though he was playing Diva Hero Beat, but I didn't side in Prohibitions because I didn't know if he was on Alias. So I didn't side those in. I just sided in like the other stuff, like Cyber Dragon and Sirocco and shit. Uh, Royal Oppression as well. We open up pretty nice here. He has a T set, but we have Space Typhoon, which is the best card in this deck. Space Typhoon and Heavy Storm are probably the best cards in this deck. Sirocco, Special Summon Bora, pump up the Bora attack with Pierce damage, dealing 1700. He's going to search for a Vasky, which basically tells me he's going to go for a Naga play, so I am going to set the D Prison. Normally you'd consider not setting it, but I am going to set it here. Um, he's going to go for the Naga attack. Once again, he telegraphed this by searching Vasky. We're just going to D Prison the Naga and pass. And then we picked up Cypher Soldier. This is a way to just clear absolute zero while dealing damage as well. We're just going to go for the attack with both. This plays a little bit around Gores, but either way, I probably should have just pumped and attacked because main phase two, I could summon Blizzy and then Black Rose blow up the field in case he did have Gores. So I think pump attack is better into Trigodia. So that was probably what I should have gone for. Uh, he goes Brain Control, takes Sirocco, pump, attack over Bora. 
Deal us 2,000. We can't use Kalut to defend from this, but we don't have Kalut anyway, so it doesn't fucking matter. Main phase 2, he sets 3, 4, and then just gives us back the Sirocco. So he takes 800 to trade the Sirocco with the thing. I'm going to summon Blizzy and just Black Rose his field. He chains Royal Oppression, and I'm like, all right, he can't stop this attack. I'm going to attack for 2,000, and that's going to be that. He reveals Gemini Spark, Hero Blast, and Miracle Fusion. These cards are already inconsistent in the dedicated hero decks. When you're adding shit like Reptilians into it, they're going to become even more inconsistent. You have to consider that. If you want to play cute stuff like Reptilians, play more generic spot removal because at least that can supplement your cute stuff. Uh, don't play this situational removal that needs one half of your deck when the other half of your deck does nothing to turn these cards on. Uh, also, Royal Oppression in these styles of decks is laughably conflicting, so... Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. GG's. This is just showing you how this deck can dismantle average decks the same way, or not average decks, but like jank decks the same way regular Black Wings can, functionally. And then the last replay I want to show you guys is versus David Smith 2. There was already a David Smith 1, so David Smith 2. We lose the Rock, Paper, Scissors. So we are going second. He's got the Infernity Archfiend sleeves, so he's kind of terrifying. We do have a pretty solid hand here though like i'm i think this hand is just like it's a comfy hand we've got gale to deal with resolve threats we've got the gadget monster stream and then we've got blizzy Kalut. so like this whole hand is just like it's just a very nice hand it plays really well into itself he's going to activate quick draw synchron he's going to pitch treeborn foolish dandy and i'm like holy shit he opened up really nice he's going to get two tokens he's going to synchro into uh stardust dragon off of a debris dragon uh, so he opened up the absolute quick draw nuts here. He's going to get two tokens. He's going to synchro into drill. He's going to pitch book of moon and he's going to set another back row uh, and then pass the turn. And even though he literally has two cards and we can beat them with Gale, um, if his basically we win the game if Gale gets through his last back row. And if Gale doesn't get through his last back row, then <laughs> we lose. That's basically what's happening here. We draw a second starlight, which kind of sucks, but that just happens. We Gale have the stardust attack. And he has Treacherous Trap Hole to blow up our Gale, which sucks ass. Because had that Gale connected, um, I'm fairly certain there's no way we could have left, lost this game. I'm fairly certain we would have just taken over the game and completely crushed. Because Gale runs over Stardust, he brings back Drill. What's he going to do? Attack into the Gale, we have Kalut. So we set one Starlight Road. He brings back Drill Warrior, grabs another Debris, makes another Stardust, which complicates the equation even more. He's able to attack for a lot of damage this turn. Now, we need to find an attack stop ASAP. Even though we had a comfy hand that can technically beat his nut draw, uh, he did have that treacherous trap hole. Here, we can summon Blizzy. Unfortunately, we don't have, like, a Bora. We do have Mirror Force. Unfortunately, it wasn't deep prison. It's kind of a 25% awkward chance. If it was deep prison here, we would have won the game. Alas, we lose the game. Um, actually, we don't even really lose the game. We have the Stardust. We attack over one of the Stardust. He can't really beat our board uh, unless he top decks. And he needs the top deck. Uh, otherwise, he can't. He can bring back tree, uh, Quick Draw. And he can tribute some Quick Draw and then Synchro into like Junk Archer, I believe. But I, I think it's like. Okay, let's figure it out here. Obviously, he top decks because he drew the nuts. And why would he not top deck Akaius after all that? He's going to bring back Treeborn. Um, he's going to add Dandy. He's going to sacrifice for Caius, targeting the Blizzy. And that's going to be game. But had he not top deck Caius, let's say he top decked something else. He would have been forced to like add back quick draw maybe like sacrifice for quick draw synchro into something um try to attack with everything in which case we can defend our blizzy with Kalut, and we have you know the potential to come back into this game thanks to green gadget so uh had he not top deck caius there i think we would have been okay unfortunately he top deck caius so let's revisit the sideboard plan Let's revisit the cyber plan for Bayou Turbo, which I believe is this one. And this is kind of how we sided in this matchup, but we also brought in those Royal Oppressions. And I should have sided out Brain Control. I make the mistake of not siding it out. I think I sided out one Blizzy because I was siding in the Royal Oppressions. I think I sided out a Lure, if I remember correctly, but we'll see. I might be misremembering. We open up with DD Crow, which is a really good card versus Quick Draw. I wish we had more than one, but the one is still going to be very clutch. And we open up with Brain Control, which is a really bad card versus Quick Draw, reminding me that I do need to actually side this card out versus Quick Draw. So, food for thought for game three, because I was just going off of my Value Turbo sideboard plan, and I was thinking, oh, I should probably side differently because Quick Draw is just a different deck. Uh, Brain Control is much worse versus Quick Draw. We do have the gadgets, though. 
which is like the best possible thing we can have to start the game. And you don't want to set bottomless here, because if you set bottomless here and your opponent sets a Raikou, then that gives them a good target. Whereas if you don't set the bottomless, then they have to target a gadget and you get a plus one, which is really good. I, a good plus one, not a bad plus one. Uh, we summon nothing. We just attack with red gadget. He gets two tokens. Main phase two, I am comfortable now going for yellow gadget and then setting the bottomless into a potential Caius. Plus, we would have to end phase discard if we don't set a card here anyway. So he's going to go for Nobleman of Extermination. We know he's on a Treacherous Trap Hole build, so it looks kind of like the Joshua Schmidt build. So that's something to consider for game three sideboarding as well. He's going to banish both our bottomless trap holes, which is annoying. He goes for Debris Dragon, and I'm thinking to myself, I can beat a Stardust, but I can't beat a Stardust and a Book of Moon, if that's what his back row is. So I do kind of have to DD Crow the Debris Dragon here, which is what we're going to do. He's going to Synchro into Iron Chain Dragon. And while Iron Chain Dragon still is stronger than everything we have, it is a lot easier to deal with than Starbucks Dragon, because I guess we could have Brain plus... If we brain control the iron chain and he books it, we can summon Shura and run it over. Or summon Green Gadget even and run it over. So it's much easier to deal with than Starbucks Dragon. He mills us for three. We mill double Bora and Mirror Force, which is good because I didn't really want to draw any of those cards right now anyway. So he passes a turn. We draw a Heavy Storm. And I'm like, that's perfect. I'm going to go for it. He's going to book the Yellow Gadget. I'm just going to flip it, summon this, Shura, Kalut. We still have Brain Sirocco to come back into this game and... If he has Gores or Tregodia, we can make Mistworm main phase two. He's a little bit ways off from using um, that one card, Avarice. So we're just going to attack with both. As you can see here, he doesn't have he doesn't have the sauce. All right, he doesn't have the sauce. He doesn't have Gores or Trag. So we're going to attack. And then main phase two, I'm going to make Android. The reason to make Android here is because his list does play Cyber Dragon. I do know that. Also, because gaining 600 is good Yu-Gi-Oh, basically. Pass the turn, gain that 600. He sets a back row and passes. I know his deck doesn't play meaningful back row. It's only on Treacherous and Book, so I can just summon this green gadget willy-nilly, search for a red gadget, and just start swinging with shit. It ends up being Scapegoat, which is interesting, but we just kill three tokens, and yeah, basically leave him with a useless token that's actually locking out his Cyber Dragon, ironically, and he can't activate Mobius uh, because these tokens can't be tributed. So he probably shouldn't have even set that, uh, although he probably needed to. What he should have done, really, was Special Summon Cyber Dragon, or Special Summon Cyber Dragon, Attack over Shura, maybe, but... Alas, here we are. He sets Typhoon, passes the turn. He's just stuck in an awkward spot. We draw Compulsory, which is super good in this matchup. I'm going to summon another gadget and just be like, fuck it, you have to have Sweepers now, or else you're going to take a million damage. We attack for 14, attack for 18, and then we go for the 2400, and he concedes. So, yeah, he just didn't have a back row to help him stabilize that game. Game three, we are going second, which does make it tough, but we adjusted our sideboarding plans, and our opening hand is fucking phenomenal we've got compulsory and sirocco to help deal with hamster and drill warrior respectively or stardust dragon if he has an early stardust and we have gadget plus avarice to guarantee our monster stream and we have starlight road to defend against black rose dragon so we have like a really good opening hand um he goes foolish burial sends dandelion gets two tokens which is fine like that's chill and then he summons debris and he makes a two card starbucks dragon which makes me very happy because i have compulsory to just get that early and quick plus one we summon red gadget Go ahead and search for yellow gadget. I'm going to go ahead and attack with a token. I thought really hard here. If he has Caius, it's better for me to not set the road. But if he has Heavy Storm, it's better for me to set the road and Compulsory Stardust Dragon in the main phase one. And if he has another Debris Dragon, it's better for me to set the road and the bottomless. So what I'm going to do is actually set the road and the bottomless because it plays around another Debris Dragon and it plays around Heavy Storm. And it also plays around Typhoon plus Caius. Whereas just Caius... He might just end up targeting the red gadget anyway, instead of targeting blind into our background, getting a 50-50. So I go ahead and just set all three. I compulsory the Stardust Dragon, sends it back to the extra, he sets a monster and passes, and we top deck our one knock, and I'm like, Jesus, I drew really good this game. <laughs> I just drew really, really well. I summon yellow gadget, I search green gadget. Despite going second, we are like commanding position here. Nobleman banishing the Rikos. And we pass the turn back. He special summons Cyber Dragon, but we have that bottom list to stuff that Cyber Dragon. He passes the turn. We draw Pulling the Rug, which is perfect. I did side these in versus this deck because I noticed this deck has Debris, this deck has Monarchs, and if it's the Joshua Schmidt list, it also has, uh, what is that guy called? Mobius. So that's why I sided the Pulling the Rug. I summon Green Gadget. I search Red Gadget. I attack with all of my gadgets. And he does have Gores. So I'm like, oh shit, I have to find a way to deal with this Gores because I don't actually have a way to deal with it. That being said, I can chill for a really long time because I have hella gadgets and I have an avarice to sort of like help me get out of this bad situation. So I'm just going to chill. I'm also at 8,000, so I'm big chilling. 
I draw another Sirocco, so I'm like, all right, Bora is going to be great here. Just summon Red Gadget, thin the deck some more. Switch my other guys to defense, pass the turn. He attacks. It's fine. Again, we have infinite life points. We draw another pulling the rug. I'm like, bruh. I summon Yellow Gadget, search Green Gadget, just pass. After setting the rug, he attacks. Totally fine. Passes the turn, and we finally draw Kalut. I'm like, hell yeah. So I can go ahead and sacrifice for Sirocco. I attack. He's forced to book a moon, which is funny. Uh, he books it. He attacks over the Sirocco. That's fine. We now have a live Avarice if we want to go for that. But I think I want to shuffle back the Kalut if possible. And we draw a Whirlwind, which is just amazing. So we finally drew into a good card. After thinning our deck five cards, we're going to tribute summon Sirocco. Search for our Gale. And the reason we're searching for Gale is because, again, I think some of these Joshua Smith style lists, they play Brain Control. They play Soul Exchange. They play a lot of targeting spell cards because they have to. They play enemy controller. So I want to play around that as much as possible. I'm going to special summon Gale. I'm going to have his gores. I'm going to synchro into Thought Ruler. This is going to help us recoup the life points that we lost the last few turns while we were dirtling. And it's also going to protect us against soul exchange and brain control, that type of stuff. Now, if you look at his hand, he doesn't really have that, but um, those are the only ways we're really losing this game. So I'm going to go ahead and Thought Ruler, run over the gores. We have Starlight Road for Black Rose, Heavy Storm. We have Pulling the Rug for Caius the Shadow Monarch and Debris Dragon. And I don't think there's really much else he can do besides Lone Fire into Titanial, which the Joshua Schmidt list specifically doesn't play. That gets over Thought Ruler Archfiend. And even if he does, I have Kalut research that Gale again because we are going to shuffle it back with Avarice. And we can Synchro into either Bryonic or Goyo Guardian to answer the Titanial. So, yeah, really good stuff for us. We're going to draw into Dark Arm Dragon, and that's just perfect because next turn I can summon Kalut, search Gale, special it, Synchro, have three Darks, and win the game. So, yeah, goaded. Nobleman, going to blind hit a pulling the rug, but we have the other one set, thankfully. He special summons Cyber Dragon, sacks for Caius, targets the Thought Ruler. We do have pulling the rug. He is able to Avarice, but he's already spent his normal. So that's pretty much that. And he has no graveyard, so Chaos Sorcerer and Miracle Fusion are not coming down here. He passes the turn. We summon Kalut, search Gale, special that, Synchro into Bryonic, exactly what we talked about, special Dark Armed, and attack for game. And you can see his hand was just a whole bunch of Monarchs some brick hero engine stuff and yeah this is the issue with quick draw it's just if you play too many of these monarch cards it's exploitable by pulling the rug and if you don't play enough of them then your deck just feels underpowered and you get out aggroed um but i think that this version of black wings does really well into quick draw simply because gadgets do really well into Ryko hamster so that's just that and that's all i've got for this deck for you guys um i think this deck is super legit it's a lot longer of a video than usual. You got six matches. I think that this is a, a totally like cool way, chill way to play Black Wings. And it'll definitely give like your opponents a, a scratching of the head. I think people should get a little bit more creative with deck building in general. I think we've seen a lot of we've seen a lot of hybrid decks in the past like do well. We've seen a lot of like new approaches to decks do well. And I think information in Edison format is one of your most powerful weapons. If you show up like Let's be honest, that last game versus the Monarch guy, would I have known to side in two pulling the rug if I hadn't seen functionally his deck list before? No, probably not. Showing up with something new can make it really hard for your opponent to accurately side versus you. It can also make it really hard for your opponent to like, you know, just like make the right plays in the context of the games themselves. So I think just having having a new approach, having a fresh perspective, thinking about things from, from the dream world, if you will, uh, dream up some new decks. I'm excited to see where this format goes from here. Smash like, subscribe, see you in the next piece.